This isn't right. So, I feel like I need to address the elephant in the room. This is September's garden tour, but it's not September. Due to some technical difficulties with the camera last time, and some illness, and some other problems, we had to abandon our shooting back in September and reschedule it right through to October. So I'm here talking to you for the September video. You're gonna see some great stuff about the harvest, some stuff from my co-director and my partner, Louisa, showing you how you can process the harvest using fermentation. And as ever, I'll answer a couple of your questions at the end of the video in the Q&A. So thanks for bearing with us. We're still gonna give you all the same information, all the same rich stuff that you have come here expecting, and I hope you enjoy it. So what did September look like in the market garden? Well, it's been a particularly strange growing season this year. I feel like the season came to quite an abrupt end a lot earlier than it usually would. So. Um, our tomato plants, for example, that you know every month you've seen them right here next to me on my left side, they were all done really early. They got blight because we had a really wet August. So the fungus got in here and killed all the plants really early. So we had to take all our tomatoes out much earlier, probably even a month earlier than we usually would. In many ways, as I've talked about through the different videos, it's been a particularly challenging growing season, probably the hardest of my growing life at least. With droughts and with no sun and lots of rain in August, um, yeah, it's just presented lots of challenges that have meant it's, it's particularly difficult and particularly different to previous years. But saying that, we've had lots of success, lots of abundance of harvests. It's been a great year for aubergines. We grew about 50 grafted aubergine plants and they've produced really well, albeit a little late going in. So the season hasn't been as long as you might hope. A great squash year this year. We just got all our squash stored inside for the winter and lots of other successes too but due to a few different challenges with the weather with time capacity our team shrinking all these things i've talked about in previous videos it's been a bit of an unusual season and there's things i'll tell you about in, in coming months too that will help to explain why it's been a particularly strange year this year um, in a very exciting way too so in august we talked about how we share our harvest through a csa scheme community supported agriculture but in this video the september video we're going to talk about preserving the harvest and my partner and co-director Louisa is going to talk to you about something called fermentation and fermentation is a really great way that you can preserve the abundance of your harvest through into the winter. Hello, thanks for joining in. I think you have seen me before because I was sometimes in the background with our little one, but this is the first time that you're actually going to see me doing something because this is mainly what I'm mainly doing. I'm not much involved in the growing. I'm busy growing another person or raising another person, but this is what I love doing. This is like using the produce, using the things that come from the garden and making them into new things. Either is it cooking at home or it is preserving, which is basically now it's like in autumn time, which we sort of coming now almost into winter slowly. And we just have a glut of things. That means we have a lot of things at one go, which for example are these chilies and I'm going to do a chili ferment today. But this could also be pumpkins, which we have a lot as well. This could also be garlic, which we have a lot. So when you have this choice of preserving you always have different options in front of you so you could go down the route of fermenting which we are going to do today which means you don't have to use any heat which means you're not going to compromise anything of the nutrition you're actually going to boost their nutritional value make it even more potent and even better for your health and um, I quite like that but then you have other ways of preserving where you're not going to change the taste very much of what you have that is canning pressure canning or water bath canning that we're not going to do that today maybe another time and you have obviously freezing which just uses more space and sometimes your freezer is full so we have that right now our freezer is full of tomatoes because i couldn't get around to making passata and it's just yeah it's just a lot of tomatoes in the freezer so i quite like fermenting and canning that's usually my go-to's when it comes to preserving and drying 
drying dehydrator on with like nettles in there, things you might not even think you want to preserve and then making powders and adding them to smoothies, to cakes or something. So dehydrating is amazing, juicing. So yeah, I'm just throwing the different names in there. Today we are with fermentation, which just means you are adding salt to whatever you're having. There's also other ways of fermenting where you don't add salt, but today we're going to do the one with salt. And then we are basically, the lactic, lactic acid will form, and that's going to, that's usually what it actually makes it more nutritional and what boosts the nutritional value and makes everything just more digestible and there's a whole thing that we could talk about but we, I'm going to focus more about um, how we're going to do this today. Um, here you can see that's like not yet completely done but it's getting there and this one here maybe I'll pour it out because I think it's actually maybe nicer if you can see it out of that. It's quite good to always keep all passata jars or anything for these kind of things that I'm doing. So I have blend this already. This one here is still like um, the chunks of chili and this one here is blended and then you can use it as a dip. So you could, if you're making pasta and you just want to add up the spiciness, you add that sauce. If you're making samosas or anything, maybe dumplings, they're perfect dip dippings and you can't have too much of this. Even people that don't quite like the spiciness of chilies like this quite a lot because it takes the edge off a little bit and it adds some sourness and equally saltiness to the chilies. And there is different ways of doing this. Today we are going to go with the method that is the most bulletproof one. I have done ones where I have used a lot of water added from the outside to make it less spicy. Today we're not going to add any water, this is going to be quite a spicy sauce in the end. Um, but all that we need for this is garlic, salt, chilies. You don't actually have to have garlic, even if you wouldn't have garlic, you could just go with chilies and salt. And I'm going to, because I've done a lot of sauces this year, I'm going to add nasturtium just because I want to try out a few different things. So I've worked a lot with just chilies, this one is chilies only, this one is chili and garlic. And this one here is going to be nasturtium. The more you add, the more nutrients you're obviously going to get. So the more diversity you're getting into your pro product that you're going to eat in the end, and the more medicinal it also gets, mostly if you add nasturtium, which is highly medicinal as well as garlic. All right, so I'm going to start crushing the garlic. Let's just use this. And that's usually the method we use in our family because we also have always limited amount of time with a three and a half year old. So it doesn't quite, sorry for that, doesn't quite want you to ever do anything other than play with him. And ideally that's pretending to be all sorts of animals right now. Okay, so I'm going to peel the garlic. The peels want to be off because that's going to be adding a really unpleasant texture if you're leaving them on. So we are, it doesn't matter whether the garlic is crushed, it doesn't have to be whole. Um, actually, I'm gonna use this bowl for that. I'm gonna put everything in a bowl. And today we're just gonna make a small amount. So it doesn't, I'm just gonna want to show you. So I'm gonna make a small amount with you. Um, so you don't need too many chilies. You wanna go for a 2% um, sort of ratio between the salt that you add to the produce you're working with. So, if you are not an experienced fermenter, you might want to weigh your, your chilies, you want to weigh even, yeah, don't bother too much with the leaves, but your chilies and the garlic, so you know how much it weighs. And if you have 500 gram, you most likely would want to go for a tablespoon of salt that you're adding. But I don't do that, I just go with the feeling, I just sprinkle it over and rub it in, because I have done it a lot. And then most of the time, at least with the chilies, it most of the time works. So when I crush that, it is much easier to peel it off. That's why I've crushed the garlic. Just makes it easier to peel it off and it speeds up the process. We often actually cook when we cook with heat. We use um, even the peel on the garlic still. So we crush it and we just throw it in like that. You could call that laziness, but it actually really creates a nice flavor. Um, just a little tip. Okay. Go the chilies. Um, I've recently discovered the scissors because that was out of desperation as well, which sometimes is good. 
because I should play and I shouldn't cook. And then I was just, I need to get this done very quickly. And then I just started, you obviously want to sterilize your scissors. And then I started chopping, which just speeds up the process, working with chilies much more, I felt. I've also fermented them whole, which means you just put them without chopping at all. Maybe you chop off the end into a glass jar. That was actually this sauce. And then I've covered them with salty water. So you weigh the water and the chilies in that case, then you sort of calculate 2% and you obviously need more salt than you would here because the water gives it much more weight. Um, and then you ferment it that way. And um, leave them for, people say sometimes a week, but I always think these people must be living in warm places. I don't think there is much happening to my things after a week around here, even in summertime, unless we have a, a hot spell until I start putting them then in the fridge. So the fermentation, fermentation slows down drastically in the fridge. And then you have that long shelf life, like that long life of whatever you have preserved. But how long ever you allow the fermentation outside the fridge to sort of continues up to your taste. So you can always taste a little bit. See, oh, this is quite sour now. I actually like that how it is. And then you can put it in the fridge. The same with sauerkraut or kimchi or whatever. Okay, now I'm going to just add a little bit nasturtium because I don't want that to like take over the taste. Maybe I just get a few flowers in there as well. Maybe it makes a nice color, I'm not sure. As I'm going to most likely blend this in the end, you can also not blend it if you want to hold chilies, but I like blending it. It doesn't actually matter too much, the coloring, because it's going to be blended, it's all blending in one. But you have a nice phase of a few weeks where you look at your jar and you're like, oh, this looks so pretty. Now the salt is going to come. Now this is like a mixture of chilies and garlic and uh, nasturtium leaves and flowers. And I'm just going to add the salt by feeling because I just want that it all feels like it's nicely rubbed with salt. The salt helps the water to go out of the thing you're working with. So in this case here, the garlic and the chilies, it's going to like sort of suck that water, the juice, the liquid out. And then it's going to create that brine, that sauce. In this one, you haven't had it added any water. The whole liquid that you see is just coming from the chilies and the garlic. That process usually takes like an hour or two, three. It really depends on how cold or warm your day is as well. And some people say you just leave it in a bowl. So you only later on, like once you got the liquid, you fill it in. But it actually works even if you start now because that way I will know if I have to do some more chilies, if it's maybe not enough for my jar. Okay, so as you can see, this is not enough. I'm gonna just make a little bit more and then gonna fill this up. All right, so we have the last Bit now that like I've made a little bit to fill it up. It's quite important that you fill it up at least to where you feel the jar gets a little bit narrower. There's not too much like gaps in there or any air or anything to like maybe yeah help mold to grow. So I'm going to just leave that open like this and um, check that later on. So what I have to find now and I'm going to show you that with this jar because I'm going to open that now that you see what I did. Here's no nasturtium in this one, in the one that you can see the big one. And here we have nasturtium in there, but they're basically the same, same principle. Okay, so we've got that ferment here that's been most likely here for a week, sitting in a heated cottage. What I just put out here is a cucumber. I usually use vegetables and then I exchange them. Like if I let something ferment for a month, then I most likely will take this cucumber out as soon as I feel it might get a little bit odd. They usually even, it's kind of odd because this one isn't completely in the brine, but I feel they never get spoiled for some reason, but I still change them every two weeks if I leave something for a month to ferment, which I tend to do. So if you do this like this, we will do later, you would find yourself with the chilies on top and the water taking over mainly the brine which we want to happen. But you would also see like here, a few chilies, sorry, I'm just getting bitten by something, um, a few chilies popping out. And ideally we want all of them to be submerged in the water. 
So what I do then, I go out in the garden because usually I realize that, oh yeah, I've forgotten that. So I go out and I find some big leaves. This one here were very big K leaves, but you could use as well, let's see what we have here, amaranth. You could even use a lot of nasturtium leaves as well. They just have to really make a nice bed and have quite a good thickness to them. So you need something that you can surround the chilies with and you can sort of stick around the corners. Obviously cabbage leaves are great because they have a really nice thickness to themselves. Once you have that leaf on top of your chili, what you're going to do then is you're going to have find something. I did find this um, cucumber in that moment. Apples work really well as, as well. So you find something that has quite a hard texture to themselves that helps you push that down even more like here this cucumber is doing. So it makes, you, makes sure that even, at least the chilies are all below that water. People work with another jar. So if they have the feeling that another little mini jar would fit into this, then they weigh it down like that. Um, you could also leave this if you have that situation where you have something that is really nicely fitting in here, snug, then you can put that in and then you um, weigh it down as well that way. If you have a very big, big barrel, but if you do that all in a massive bulk situation, then you can use plates. People use plates as well, putting plates in. But I really love not adding anything that is not nature into the way, way I weigh down my ferments. And so I usually only work with cucumbers or apples. Apples are also really good. I'm going to show you, because this is obviously only chilies. If I would bite into one of these, it would be really, really spicy. They're really spicy now because they have been, the more they ripen, the more spicy they get. And I have made this ferment with these chilies. But when you sort of go through that whole fermentation process, you take a little bit of their spiciness away, which is nice if you actually want to consume them. If you maybe want your child to also have a little bit of chilies here and there, because chili is super healthy for your body. So I'm just going to have now the spoon and I'm not going to freak out because Yes, it's spicy, but it's really nice. It's like the perfect mild spiciness. And I most likely had like the equivalent of one whole chili there right now with that spoon because I blended it. So you're getting so much like benefits from the plant without needing to necessarily suffer so much when you ferment them. It's just very good. Well, there we are. Thank you again to Louisa for doing that. Just a quick note, it was amazing that what, what has been made. Like it's almost like a, like a perfect addition to so many different dishes, especially if you're a fan of um, hot and specifically that was a bit salty as well. So it just, yeah, it would be a perfect accompaniment to so many different dishes. And yeah, because it's not been cooked first, all that goodness is, is still in. Um, right, so Q and A section to the video. Have two questions today for you, Abel. One is coming from me because we haven't had lots of different questions. So if you would like to ask Abel, we've got a few months left because we're gonna end in January because we started in February this year. So if you'd like a question to be asked, comment down below. Okay, so today's question comes from Funky Louise 456 and it is, what's the difference between a veg box subscription service like Riverford and a CSA like Glassbren? Mm. Hi Funky Louise, that's a great question and one we get asked quite a lot. So there is quite a big distinct difference and it's, it's <clears throat> they can be confused for each other because we both talk about veg boxes and I use the phrase veg box scheme. But uh, a CSA is quite different. If, if it's kind of a CSA in its true spirit, it's very different to a veg box scheme like Riverford. So a veg box scheme like that is, is more of a subscription service or it's kind of like an online farmer's market or an online shop so you're getting essentially you're often getting a choice of items so you're choosing what what goes in your box and it's getting delivered to your door and it's more of a convenient service rather than CSA which is a much more holistic community building um, food distribution tool so yeah like vegbot schemes often depend on multiple farms central distribution points they're often more widely distributed because they're more of a business it's, you know so it's quite a different thing to a CSA is all about local, your hyper... All right, sorry, everyone. A CSA is, is all about your hyper-local community. Um, it's a membership-based scheme rather than a subscription. So 
it's not like you just sign up and then you subscribe and then when you, when you decide it's not really working for you, you just cancel your subscription and move on. It's a commitment over a season to enjoy a weekly share in the harvest, which you don't get a choice of. So um, it is really surrendering to the seasonal nature of, of the Welsh harvest, um, given that we're here in Wales. Um, so that's one of the fundamental differences. Another one is that CSA is, is all about community building. So it's about using food as a tool in a vehicle for like building a community around something of substance, um, rooted in local lands and, and of um, importance to all of us. So the way the food, the food is grown is really important. Um, but as much as that is the storytelling and people getting involved in growing it, having their hands in the soil, having a connection to the farm and a relationship with it. So um, we only distribute in a 10 mile radius. There's no plastic packaging in our veg boxes because they, go, they get harvested in, in the morning, and go into veg, into veg box members' houses in the afternoon. Um, so that's one thing, it's fresher than most veg box um, subscription services. Um, yeah, I think the core difference I'd say, if I was to summarize, was like the community building aspect of CSA. That's probably the fundamental difference as well as things like freshness, um, locality, uh, knowing the farm and where it comes from, all those additional benefits. I think the core thing is, is the, the community building and the support for farmers. That's that's because, you know, a, a farmer selling into a veg box subscription scheme is not that different to a farmer selling into a wholesaler or, or a supermarket in the sense that they're still getting that base market rate for their produce and that might go up and down at any time according to the demand. So um, CSA is a lot more forgiving, secure and supportive for farmers um, than a veg box subscription. So yeah, if you come to us expecting something like Riverford, you'll probably be disappointed. Um, and if you go to Riverford expecting um, to the be part of a community aspect, and yeah. to know the farmers, um, that you will get that to an extent with Riverford. Of course, we all know um, Guy Singh Watson very well, but um, yeah, less so, less so in that case. So that's that's probably yeah what I'd say are the main differences. Um, both are great, both serve their purpose, but they're very different things. Excellent. And then I have another question today from myself. And it's partly going off of, this is my favorite space. One of the reasons that I chose this angle and uh, a lot of the photography and video that we've been doing throughout the year has been in here, not only because polytunnels are just a huge soft box, so it's beautiful lighting, but also there's it's just a smell and there's just something about the space as well that it's just great. And it's somewhere that when myself and Alicia, which is happening, guys, if you're interested, we will at some point get, uh, hopefully be able to start growing again. But um, I can't talk about what we're doing uh, so, so much at the moment because we're going through the bureaucratic government process of actually being able to get access to that. But one day we're hoping that we will have stuff like this. And the polytunnel is a growing space that I am really interested um, to get more in depth with, with going into. Uh, but my question is, with growing in this polytunnel, specifically, obviously here we're in Wales, what for you are the key things that you've learned? And what I mean by that is, are there things that, for example, tropical plants or trees or whatever that have done really well and you weren't expecting them to or has it gone against that mm. and actually there are certain things that maybe you thought would do really well because they're in a polytunnel where actually they probably would have done just as well if not better outside in the welsh weather mm. okay um so to start off with uh, just a bit about why we use polytunnels so in wales here quite an unpredictable climate. Uh, we don't have the consistent sunshine and warmth throughout the growing season that many other places enjoy. So polytunnels, glass houses have become quite an essential part of um, extending the growing season and being able to supply people with veg, fruit um, for a longer period of time. So most people who grow in this country will have a polytunnel or a glass house. Um, they have multiple different uses. So the main and obvious one is that we can grow Mediterranean summer crops um, really successfully using polytunnels. So you've seen throughout the year, we grow our tomatoes, aubergines, peppers, chilies. Um, yeah, those are the kind of core things that we grow in here. They do really well. It's uh, much easier to control the temperature, the atmosphere. Um, and yeah, that's, that's an obvious reason, but there's 
lots of other reasons to use tunnels too. I mean, um, off-season growing is a really core one. So um, for reasons I can't really talk about until next month's video or a couple of months time actually, um, this doesn't look so full in here right now, but ordinarily we would have these beds now planted up with spring cabbages. So they're things that are gonna grow through the winter and be harvested early in the spring. You might also get some broad beans in here, some carrots, some beetroot. Um, so those things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to grow outside through the winter and into early spring, you can grow inside because you maintain that slightly warmer temperature. Um, so that's what I, one thing I really love about tunnels is, is the off season growing and being able to have fresh greens for most of the year, to be honest. Um, and otherwise, the really exciting thing we've had is the perennial stuff that we've been growing. So one thing I'd like to mention is Cape gooseberries. So they're also known as Fasalis. They're a lovely little um, orange berry in a little chrysalis. Um, and they've done really well in the tunnel and they've really replicated and they're really nice, fun food to forage, especially for kids. Kids love kind of getting in there and finding the ripe ones and then peeling them out of their, their natural wrappers, if you like. Um, grapes. Um, probably through the season, you remember seeing footage of our grapevine, which is, believe it or not, only three years old uh, from a cutting. And that has created, we put it over trellis over the top, and it's created not only a huge abundance of grapes, but it also has created a really nice um, shade over the first part of the tunnel where we often end up sitting um, having lunch or sheltering from the rain. It's created a really nice shade to kind of keep that sun back. So um, that's a really great thing. We've had our first nectarines of our nectarine tree inside. So I'd recommend growing nectarines um, espalier style. So um, growing them along the horizontal on wires. Um, and that way you can use unused space of your polytunnel, maybe the pathways or in between your crops to grow nectarines. Uh, we've had our first figs this year inside. Um, we're also having a go at kiwis. Um, what else is going on? Is there anything that you found that hasn't worked how mm. you thought it would? Um, some things have taken longer than we thought and some things have been quite hard to keep watered sufficiently. Um, but generally speaking, it's all, everything does slightly better in a tunnel. Um, you just have to be careful of the things for which it might be too dry or too hot uh, and might force things to bolt. So for example, in the early season, you can often get a sudden bolting of all your crops because the sun comes and then all of a sudden the ambience of the tunnel changes and so the plants just go Whoa! and sort of go into making seed. So um, yeah, but apart from that, I love growing in tunnels. I don't love the plastic element. It'd be great if we could have a glass house or an alternative to plastic, but in terms of an affordable, quick way to get covered growing space, um, they're really they're really great and, and they do last quite a long time. And um, yeah, you can get them of all, all different sizes according to your needs. Um, what I might suggest is if you're growing multiple different crops, um, especially in a sort of market garden setting or a larger scale, having rather than having bigger, bigger tunnels, um, having multiple tunnels is probably, multiple smaller tunnels is probably a better way to go. So for example, we grow our cucumbers separate to our tomatoes because they require quite different um, conditions. Cucumbers for one require a lot more water. Um, so tomatoes don't need so much, especially once they start producing fruit. Um, different atmospheric conditions, so tomatoes don't appreciate any moisture in the air really, whereas cucumbers are happy with a bit of moisture. Aubergines like a bit of moisture on their leaves. So yeah, um, rather than just expanding your the size of your tunnel, I would suggest having multiple smaller tunnels um, according to how much you need to grow of each of your typical uh, polytunnel crops. And that way, if you don't want to use all of your space of a season, you could just shut one tunnel down, for example, for the winter, or um, it gives you a bit more control. Obviously that costs more to set up because you've got to buy multiple frames. Um, but in the long run, I think it's a better um, way to control the climatic conditions in the different tunnels. Excellent. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. So that's it for September, October, which is today, <laughs> although we're filming it, uh, the October video will be coming out in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so it's probably going to, it's going to be September and October's both are going to come out obviously in October. Um, but for today, thank you again, everyone. And we'll see you next month. See you next month. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye.